Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm continuing my lecture series into theories of ethnicity and nationality. We are on section 2.2 .2 on page 26 of my notes. Uh, to access the notes, just click the link in the description field. It'll take you to the notes, download them, use it to supplement your, your readings. We're continuing our read from theories of nationalism, and uh, this is section 2.2. .2. We're almost done with the uh, with the series, so that's always a good thing. Let's begin. Uh, two point two, and this is modernism. Um, so, modernism. First bullet point, the nation has become a sociological necessity. Right? The nation has become a sociological necessity. And I like this, right? This is not a consequence of social biology, right? It's not saying that the nation is a consequence of um, sociobiological necessity. It's just that the nation has become a an, uh, an, um, necessity. The nation has become a necessity. Well, why? As I said in my last video um, lecture, which was 2.1, it's a consequence of the social interaction of individuals. If you think about inferentially, right, this is strictly on a logical basis, if you think about inferentially the consequences that are going to be necessitated as a consequence of our sociality, well, our sociality determines the fact that we are socially inclined, the, the fact that we are in, um, socially, socially defined as well as inclined means that we're going to group up, right? So hey, hey, what are you doing? Oh, let's start a bike club, or let's start a, let's start a, you know, a freaking, you know, World of Warcraft craft club, or let's start a, you know, a you know, fashion show, and let's you know, whatever. I mean, as diverse as you can possibly think of, people are going to group up based on themes, based on ideas, based on principles and values and ideologies and morals and blah blah blah. Well, the idea is, since our sociality is um, bound to our humanity, and I wouldn't say it's part of human nature because you have people who are asocial, obviously, right? So that's another reason why I don't believe in human nature. So barring the asocial typology, um, you recognize that people tend to click up in groups. And in terms of their association with others in groups, these groups um, confer identity. In addition to their own identity, the amalgamation, the consolidation, the solidification of big numbers into one theme creates an identity within that group. So the group now has an identity that would not be there were it not for the aggregation of individuals into collective units, into collective groupings. So group identity is created as a consequence of our sociality. That formation, that creation of group identity then attributes back to the individual identity. So it's, it's cyclical, not really cyclical, but you can imagine that we have our sociality. You have our socio sociality on the one hand. That sociality is going to then inform um, collective grouping, right? That collective grouping, we're going to create a group as a consequence of our sociality, right? That collective grouping is then, it's not just going to be a group of, no, that collective group needs a name, it needs a symbol, it needs a history, it needs a mythos, it needs, it needs something that identifies not the individuals, but identifies the collection of individuals in the group. So that our sociality informs collective grouping, but that collective grouping then requires identification. The group needs to be identified, right? So the group needs identification. And that identification with the group then informs our sociality, right? The group has an identity, and I can say, I'm affiliated with Group X. Oh, wow, you know, Jason, uh, he's affiliated with Group X. And I like Jason, so let me check out Group X. Let me see what Group X is about. Um, oh, you know, Mary, she's affiliated with Group Y. I like Mary, let me see what Group Y is about. Hey, I want to be part of that. I want to have that affiliation. So that the idea is... It's not just our own personal identity that we bring, because obviously we bring our personal identity to any social act. It's the manner in which 
that collective grouping then creates a need for identification. The group itself needs identification. And how that identification then imbues new additional meaning onto who you are. Right? And for some people, this is, this is important. You'll look at the back of their car, all their decals are there for all their group affiliations. They, people wear rings, people wear shirts, people go to meetings, people go to conclaves and conferences, and people hang plaques on the wall for all of the affiliations that they have. And most of us have multiple. It would be an interesting sociological study to see the amount of active groups that any individual person is affiliated at, with you know, at any one time. I would imagine... I would imagine barring sort of just regular friendships that individuals have, you know, I'm friends with Mary and Tina and Bob, or I go play poker with the guys every day. A group that actually attains a name, not all group, collective groupings, attain sort of the mass or the significance in order for the group to be named. But for those that do, they ascribe meaning, right? So this identification is meaningful. They ascribe meaning back to our social actions, right? The idea is, this is exactly how the nation is formed, right? The nation, conceptually, is a consequence of the collective grouping, which is itself a consequence of our sociality. The formation of the nation, the identification that the nation is able to um, purvey, is such that individuals in their national affiliation, they retain new identity. And this is obvious for any number of reasons, one sort of pedestrian reason being, this is why people who are not citizens of a particular nation X seek citizenship. They seek citizenship for benefits, for rights. They seek citizenship because they've stayed there long enough or they fall in love with somebody who's from that place and they love the culture. Any number of reasons. They've identified, they've come to identify with those things that the nation is said to represent. So. If you take any aspect, if you take the collective grouping out, you can't have identification. If you take our sociality out, there's not going to be any collective. If you take the power of identification, there's no need to want to be affiliated. It's because we get new identity that we want to be affiliated, that we remain loyal. Like It's that consistent, you can imagine, and I'm not going to deconstruct this anymore, um, but you can imagine that individuals get into a group initially, start at some base level and work there, if it's a hierarchical structure, work their, their way up through whatever ranks or whatever systems the group has. Um, and there's a lot. As you progress, the fact that you're progressing shows the, your interest, your continued interest in the group. It's a means of keeping people interested in terms of, in terms of national identification. It's seemingly all or nothing. I'm in the group or I'm not in the group. But it's really not that case, right? There's always more that can be done. And as I said in the last lecture series, um, and uh, again, it's too, it's too early. I need to get my coffee. But it's too early. It's too early in the morning to sort of full-fledged propaganda. But it's not what you can do. Well, not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for it. Right? That sense of identification is going to instill a relationship, an affective relationship an influential relationship in which the individual participant influences. Um, and now, now this is a bit more advanced, but the individual participant influences um, the nation in some sense, in some very abstracted sense. We'll talk about that later. And obviously how the nation influences the individual. It's really simple to understand how the nation influences the person. It's very difficult to understand how the person influences the nation. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it briefly. So number two. So... A sociological necessity, we, we understand what that means, right? Um, in terms of nationalism, national, nationalism comes to form in an era between the French and Industrial Revolution, right? So, in terms of modernism, you know, it's sort of obvious, I don't want to spend too much time on that sort of historical fact, it just is the case. The conditions that led to the truth of this statement is something that I would leave for historians to account for, right? So, I'm not going to go into the historical context that led to the formation of nationalism within this era. I'm sure there's any number of reasons, scientific enlightenment, post-revolution, obviously, sort of macro-level global change. And that global change in terms of the people and people's rights, people's claim to their rights, their claims to their humanity, their claims to representation within the political establishment creates a new era, creates a new paradigm, right? But again, I'm not going to go in any detail in that. Okay, so the quote 
Um, let's read it. The uneven wave of modernization over state territories creates advanced and less advanced groups. Right? The uneven wave of modernization over state territories creates advanced and less, and less advanced groups within the states. The resources and power are distributed unequally between two groups. Makes sense. The powerful group or the core tries to stabilize its advantages, right? So within the state, a powerful group, a weaker group, right? Um, so advanced and a less advanced. The more powerful, the more advanced group needs and absorbs more resources. The less powerful group, not so. Seems pretty obvious. Powerful group or the core ties, um, tries to stabilize its advantages through the institutionalization of the existing stratification system. I'll explain that. The economy of the core is characterized by a diversified industrial structure, whereas the peripheral economy is dependent and complementary to that of the core. So that you can you can recognize, let's say we're talking about um, the nation, and we're talking about a more powerful group, P-O-W-E-R. So let's use the terminology that they use, right? The powerful group or the core tries to stabilize its advantages through institutionalization of the existing stratification system. The economy of the core is characterized by a diversified industrial structure. So we'll actually call it the core. The economy of the core, and I would imagine the core should be in the center. The economy of the core, I'm surprised I didn't draw a picture of this. Did I draw a picture of this? Um, I actually did draw a picture of this. Yeah, I actually drew a picture of this. So we'll, we'll, what I'll do is I'll refer to my picture. I forgot I drew a picture of this. I'll refer to my picture in a second. It's on the next page. So it, it would have been nice to have it on book. I remember now. I tried to have this paragraph and the image on the same page, but I couldn't. I couldn't get it on the same page. Um, the powerful group or the core tries to stabilize its advantages through the institutionalization of an existing stratification system. So the core group in the center, peripheral groups on the periphery. The economy of the core group is characterized by diversified industrial structure, whereas the peripheral economy is dependent and complementary to, the, that, to that of the core. So I'll explain this in a second. The core will dominate the periphery politically and exploit them economically. So that's important. I'll write this on the board because once I get to the, the next page, I don't want to have to keep on flipping back and forth. So let's write that down because it's important. The core will dominate. The core will dominate the periphery uh, politically and exploit it economically. Okay. So the core will dominate the periphery politically right, and exploit them economically. And we'll return to this. All right. So. Um, political domination, economic domination. I'm going to talk about both, but what I want to do is go to page 27 and um, let's look at an example of how this manifests beyond just the abstract, right? Let's look at how this manifests in terms of um, a process of ethnic nationalism. This is also connected to section 1.8. It was a while ago, a few hours ago, but if you want to look at 1.8, and then watch this section of the video, the both are linked. The idea was it wasn't appropriate to talk about this in section 1.8 because we were still um, sort of at the tail end of our discussion of ethnicity. Then we talked about ethno-territoriality, then we moved into nationalism. Now we can build uh, a more ingrained, interdependent sort of conceptual bridge between 1.8 and this by talking about the process of ethnic, uh, ethnic nationalism. So there's a number of things that will be happening now. This is a little bit more complex, but I'll go slow so that it's clear. Many, uh, uh, many different things that we're doing. One, we're going to talk about the relationship between um, political um, domination and what that means, political domination, and economic exploitation of the periphery. So political domination, economic exploitation. We're going to take that, which can't, I mean, this is not my saying. This is from the text. We're then going to take that idea of political domination and economic exploitation and apply it specifically to ethnic nationalism. 
right? So when we talk about ethnic nationalism now, what is it that we mean? How is it that we are going to um, understand this process? So let's begin right at the at the bottom. So at the bottom left, uh, bottom right of this image on the top of page 27, you see capitalism as the core ideological force, right? So we have capital sort of at the core, right? We have capital at the core. So that the core, the core structure, social structure, and obviously this core social structure has, for the context of this discussion, an ethnical affiliation. It doesn't need to have an ethnical affiliation. You can do exactly the same structure that exists independent to ethnical affiliations. But within the context of ethnic nationalism, and obviously this would be, well, this could be classified as either binary or segmentary. I'm probably going to do this, present this in terms of ethnical binary conflict, right? We talked about the distinction between binary um, ideological substrates and segmentary ideological substrates, binary in previous videos. Bi and this should, you know, this is nearing the end, so now we're going to talk sort of jargon. Um, binary segmentary substrates are, ideological substrates are, are that in which via Schmidt, friend enemy, ideological considerations determine um, one's identity nationally. I am not those people, those people are not me. Whereas segmentary ideological substrates are going to, um, in a negative sense, define the hostile or antithetical relationship, ethnical relationship that groups have. And it's going to be multifaceted conflict, individual ethnical population, rather than having a binary opposition, um, a binary ideological um, incompatibility with one group is is in any number of multifaceted antithetical ethnical relationships. Some will be more hostile than others. Some might actually be more determined by um, cooperation. And then we talked about how segmentary ideological substrates can transform, transition into interdependence as a benefit. So the former two, more negative, more hostile in the determination of its relationship. Obviously, interdependence is not hostile, it's beneficial. So this can be applied to ethnical conflict, but recognize that it can be described independent to ethnical conflict. What's important here is the recognition to take it even a step deeper, which I didn't, I forgot to put this on, uh, on my notes. This is ethnical nationalism um, articulated specifically in terms of binary um, ideological substrate. Right? It's a binary sort of hostile hostility. One group, one ethnical population versus another ethnical population and capital as the driving uh, market economy. So capitalism has to be the driving market and economy. There has to be two existing ethnical popul populations feuding for political power and this is part this is part, I mean, it's a rather generalized form, part of the way in which we explain this relationship. So, as we see, the core will, the core, this is a direct quote, right? The core will dominate, the core will dominate the periphery politically and exploit it economically. So, from one, we recognize that the, the second, it's in the upper left, sort of directly across diagonally. So, here's number one, number two is in the upper left or the mid left corner. Ethnically defined periphery. So we're going to label this P. Right? So this is our ethnically defined periphery. This is our ethnically defined ethnically defined periphery. Alright, so we have our core, we have our ethnically defined periphery. And then what we see in number three is the the relationship on both sides. In terms of political domination, in terms of political domination, the core, the core is dominating the periphery. So political domination is an imposition of force on. Political domination is, I mean, it could even be structural, but more than likely it's, it's physical, right? It's an apparatus of state power. It doesn't have to yield physical violence. Was, there's at least the exertion of force, right? And Althusser and others, and you know Foucault and any number of theorists, especially Foucault, talk about the manifestation of um, political domination. P 
political domination and pathologization in terms of its affiliation with, you know, um, the sites, with the, the shrinks and such. Um, so the idea is political domination is an imposition, right? It is an intrusion, an encroachment, if you will. So political domination. And the way to think of this is that there's a substrate. That substrate is the peripheral ethnical community. That peripheral eth ethnical community is outside. This is all within the context of the nation, however. They're outside. Since they're outside, what is it? This is very fiendish in a sense, but what is it that we, the core, we, the, the, the common or the dominant or the privileged or advanced ethnical identity, what is it that we can get from this peripheral? Obviously, this is a better condition, as exploitative as it is, it's a better condition than genocidal um, inclinations, right? A genocidal inclination by the court would result in the dehumanization and the mass extermination of the group. This is less, this is less excessive use of political power, political force. It's still exploitative, nonetheless, right? So that political domination is an imposition of force on the peripheral ethnical population, and there's any number of, you know, bits of literature that can be written on this. This is why I didn't want to explain this on the last page. It's better that I sort of integrate both into one. Coming from the peripheral now, and these arrows are in a direction for a reason, coming from the peripheral then, right, so it's political domination on to the peripheral, and coming from the peripheral is economic exploitation. Think of it like as a vacuum, sucking up all the resources, sucking up all the labor, sucking up all the wealth, sucking up as much as possibly can. This is like the scene in, uh, I think it's either, was it There Will Be Blood or um, No, I forget which, I think, it, I'm not sure, I forget which one it was, um, where he talks about the milkshake. If you have a milkshake and I have a long straw and I can drink your milkshake for that, it's that idea, which is just absolutely awesome, right? Um, it's that, and this is economic exploitation, right? We have economic exploitation. Or, what did I define it as? Uh, yeah, economic exploitation. E-C-O-N-O. -O. Okay, so, in relationship between the core ethnical population and the peripheral exploit, uh, ex uh, peripheral um, ethnical population, the core is always seeking to expand power. Power is always in place to preserve its existing power, transform it, right, there is also a transformation, um, transformative power, and expand, right, it's about getting more power, it's about getting more powerful. In terms of its structure, it, this obviously presupposes um, ethno-territorial conflict, right, this obviously, uh, and we'll see how this un unfolds in a bit, our core ethnical population, our peripheral ethnical population, um, what we're exporting, if you will, so to sort of just consolidate this into simple terms, we export violence. We import money. Right? So we export violence and domination, and we import cash. And that's basically the template. And that template to be honest with you, is a very, it's very, very powerful in terms of national identification of almost any nation. Now, it's unfortunate within a contemporary world, it's unfortunate that this is true. It, it will prove to be less true. There will be less need for this structure. The structure is it's an embedded... Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be contextualized within modernism, right? You don't have to necessarily contextualize this in modernism, though obviously modernism applies to this account. This is within the context of modernism. But it, and it being ethno, um, ethno-nationalism is obviously within the context of modernism. We can talk about it. What's important, however, is to recognize the need for transformation because in global interdependence, nobody wants to be a partner with um, the nation that is known for exporting violence, right? Everybody wants to minimize and or mitigate at least the use of violence to necessary uses of violence, and I can go into a, that requires its own, I mean, that would be like a semester's lecture. That's way too much to talk about here. But the exportation of violence is a means of doing any number of things. It's the importation of capital that that's key, 
right, in a market economy, the importation of capital. And it doesn't necessarily mean need to be via savings from tariffs and all that. The importation of capital in its grandest, broadest sense. These two concepts are bound. They've historically been bound. It's, it's almost impossible to separate the two. Colonialism, exportation of violence, importation of, 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 of capital. Globalization, exportation of violence, importation of capital. And people, people, unfortunately, I think social theorists have almost you know, waved the white flag of, of surrender in that it's hard to conceptualize a manner in which we can secure global capitalism but decrease and diminish the exportation of violence. And to be honest with you, this is the stuff that I'm interested in. This is very, very nuanced stuff with respect to nationalism and the formation of national identity. But I am myself working through exactly how this process can be protected, right? How you can protect global capital, um, but have a more humanistic side, have a, a recognition that it doesn't need to be it. Global capitalism doesn't need to be as exploitative as it has been. It doesn't have. It doesn't have to be as insensitive and, and domineering, and you know, all encompassingly destructive as it's been. It does not have to be. It really doesn't. And I believe this. I'm not going to lecture on this now because it's going to take us off on a tangent. But the idea is the conceptual framework with which we can generalize from ethnical nationalism, which is what we're talking about. You see immediately, and I think that this, this is the power of sort of logic and this is the power of, of understanding, is you see really how everything is interconnected. You can talk about non-ethnical national conflict in the 21st century and buttress all of your arguments for the possibilities of the future in terms of ethnical nationalism. I mean, if that's not complicated and if that's not intricate, I don't know what is, but it's, it's a beautiful thing to recognize that we can step out of field. But it, it shouldn't be to no surprise, I need to get back on, on uh, sort of topic in a little bit, because we talk about feminism as applied to um, behavioral psychology, right? You can talk about disciplines beyond the bounds that the disciplines were designed to sort of articulate conditions for. Similarly, we can talk about the application, the generalized, the generalized, generalizability, generalizability of um, ethnical nationalism to just the contemporary discourse on nationalism, and we recognize, and these two points are absolutely key, super critical, that is the union, um, the rather diabolical union of the importation of capital and the exportation of violence, right? This is, this is a rather fiendish uh, fact of this relationship. And again, that fact of the relationship transcends ethnical nationalism. Now, in terms of the, the, the drive to transform, the transformative um, drive, we see that this population is going to be dominated. There's going to be violence in play. We see that this population is going to be um, economically weakened, economically exploited, and that the relationship between being dominated physically, being dominated via violence, and losing constantly resources is going to create sort of embers of rebel revolution. Right? You can imagine that hostilities against the core ethnical group will build as a natural sort of as a natural progression of just dominance and exploitation. So what ends up happening, conceptually if you think about it, is in number four, right at the the very sort of top the upper part above the peripheral ethnical population is that we're looking now for secessionist ideologies. This is where secessionist ideologies begin. This is where transformative um, discussions on power, the need for power transformation and the need for um, the occupation, if you will, not physical occupation, but the occupation of political power as the mode for transformation, right? Political power is in place as a vehicle for transformation via policy and legislation and such, right? Political power is extremely powerful. It's probably, I mean, there are many types of power, but in terms of macro level, global scale, it's pretty, it's up there, right? We have, we have much larger conglomerates now. We have um, U European Union, we have United Nations, we have the, um, you know, the International Monetary Fund. We have any number of enormous, expansive global structures that are potentially more powerful than the power of a nation state 
whether you like that or not, it's true, right? We have any number of entities that are, um, proportionally speaking, more powerful. They have more effect on the global order than the decisions that one state or one nation, even the United States of America, makes. The idea is a recognition that the function, the expression of that power is magnified by whatever policies are written, whatever rules, whatever legislation is passed. So that we recognize as exploited people, the peripheral, we now changing who we are, we, the ethnical peripheral population, recognize that we're not going to get any economic advantages under this current system. This current system isn't designed to benefit us. This current system is designed to benefit them. At the consequence of our own exploitation, it's that recognition, it's that epiphany, it's that realization collectively, and there's that in itself requires on an entire lecture, which I'm not going to give. <clears throat> but it's the recognition that it's not happenstance, it's not arbitrary. The very foundation of the existing political system is a consequence of our inherent exploitation. It is built to exploit us. This is sort of the apartheid model. You can't function with a system where the very nature of the system is built on inherent exploitation of um, another ethnical community. So what ends up happening, we need, we, the peripheral population, this is partly why it's right in modernist um, theory, because we recognize the power of revolution. We recognize the power of collective mobilization. We recognize the power and the transformative ability to either through violence or nonviolent means, it can be both, both have legitimate, um, both have legitimate um, influences on power, and both have been successful. And both have probably been equally, well, I mean, historically speaking, violence has been more successful than nonviolence. Nonviolence is new. If you think, if you think about sort of the continuum of all human, um, and you know, that, quick side note, that's a great idea, right? That's a really good idea, sort of. If you think of human civilization, um, documented human civilization since Egyptians until now, and the overthrow of regimes and the transformations of political power, we had to sort of, not evolutionary in the biological sense, but conceptually, we had to evolve the way in which we interpret um, relationships, national relationships, to evolve to the point where we recognize we could have transformative effects nonviolently, because the history of human civilization is all about violent transformation. It's only now, in a, in a, a 19th, 20th century, specifically 20th century sense, from Henry David Thoreau to Gandhi to um, uh, Mandela to, obviously, Martin Luther King, that we can talk about the true transformative effects of nonviolence um, in terms of political power. I mean, you have to think, of, there is, this is why I have, I, I, again, you guys know I hate to use the word hope, but this is why I have hope. You cannot possibly fathom conceptually how difficult it is to account for that fact. It is a social fact. We've seen it happen. Conceptually, all, everything would suggest logically that that's nearly impossible. You mean you can reason with a guy and just sit down? You can reason with a chick? You can just sit down and talk to them and they'll concede power? They'll yield some? They'll be more inclusive? I mean... Nothing about our sociality suggests that we would do that. But the fact is, we have started to do that. Why? Because at the end of the day, I think the recognition that the importation of capital is more important than exporting violence. Violence is a means, and has been used as a means to secure capital. But if we can preserve that, and this is exceptionally the case. This is specifically the case with respect to the civil rights movement in the U.S. because um, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and, and many, many, many others recognize that violence, the use of violence on our people, on our community, is affecting us. And we're going to crash this system because we're not going to give our money to you. We're going to hold back on our resources. We'll walk to work. We'll walk to work every day. And what ends up happening? All that capital that was going into the busing system is now gone. And people start to recognize, no, these people have money. These people have money. Let's not be so violent. 
Right? Because if we're violent, if we keep on abusing them, they won't spend their money with us. And the truth of the matter is, I could care less whether we use violence or not. But God knows I don't want to lose that money. So that now, in the 21st century, you will invariably see, and we've seen this, right? I saw this in the protest with Hispanic Americans in protest for um, um, House Resolution Bill, dot, dot, dot. I've seen this um, to a lesser degree in the gay community um, and lesser degrees in other communities where there is a recognition of the power of, it's not just the state that can impose economic sanctions, right? They don't think that this is just embargo on Cuba or economic sanctions on Iran. The people can impose economic sanctions on the state. Right? If you're going to continue to abuse us, we are collectively going to mobilize, and this is this is historically worked. I mean, this is, but this is a new phenomenon. Right? This is a 1950s onward phenomenon. The the power in this ability is the organization of the protest. Right? The organization of the belief, the willingness of the people to recognize that no, despite the fact that I would love to spend these bucks, I'm not going to spend it to send a message, and that that will transform the nature of political establishment. It's very new. It's very, very new. It's not even 100 years new. Um, it's very, very new in terms of its global use. I mean, the, the, again, the seeds of this were planted before, but, you know, in terms of violent revolutions, not to say that it isn't easy for someone to pick up a gun and try and revolt and pull the power structures out of power, but it's more likely in the future that transformations, and, and I don't know, there might be some debate on this, right? I would hope that transformative political power will unfold more nonviolently than violently, not because the people are scared or aren't armed or aren't willing to fight for it, just because there really might not be a need for it anymore, right? There might be other ways, um, much more powerful ways of impacting social change than picking up a gun and trying to, uh, you know, take take power by force. Now, granted, this also is biased because I live in the United States and other parts of the world. I recognize the brutality of despotic regimes requires that some people get killed. I get that. I get that. I really do get that. And that's what it is. In the United States of America, that's really not the case. And political transformation can be mobilized and can be necessitated and even mandated by the proper, systematic, deliberate, coordinated um, use of sort of economic sanctions, if you will, on the state from the people. You can't do that. All right. So this transformation, this transformative uh, um, need, is a consequence of the recognition of the peripheral ethnical population. Their recognition that they are being dominated with violence and they're being exploited economically, and their need to make transformative political moves so that they then assume political power. So the desire for usurping existing political power and thus transforming the nation ethnically, because we're talking about ethnically defined, ethnically identified nationalism. It's the nation, the transformation of national identity is now going to be an ethnical transformation. Why? Because existing ethnical population X is in power and they're exploiting us. Why? Once we get them out, once we get X out, we're going to assume power, and thus the nation is going to be defined by this new ethnicity. Thus, ethnical nationalism is, um, is a motivation of the transformation of political power via ethnical identity. Right? I'll say that again. Uh, ethnical nationalism is it's the transformation of political power via ethnical identity. My ethnical identity is that which will define the structure, the nature, the, it's more the myth of the new, the cosmogony of the new um, ethnical elite, if you will, the ethnical decision makers, but we got to get the old guard out and put ourselves in. Okay. Um, and what ends up happening? Well, the cycle sort of repeats itself, right? Ethnically declined, ethnically um, um, defined political establishment. So the new, the peripheral, what was once the peripheral, now becomes the, and this is everything is, is cyclical, right? What was now the peripheral ethnical population now becomes the core. That core establishes policies of exploitation to some, probably the former, um, the former group, 
this happens, I mean, there's any number of global examples for this. There's tons of examples of this. They establish policies to exploit, reverse engineer, if you will, right? To deconstruct what was constructed to exploit them, and then uh, apply that same structure to the former political establishment. And this goes on and on and on. Any number of players can come back into the, the fore and transform sort of the identity of any ethnical population, but the structure is the same. Core, defined by political, the exportation of political domination, the importation of surplus capital, and uh, both of those require extensive sort of um, extensive discussion. I just don't have the time. Uh, and we're almost like 20 hours into the lecture already, so this is already starting to get um, a bit long. So we recognize that. So that's the key point, right? The, the key point is the exportation of violence, the importation of capital. We realize that in terms of the peripheral ethnical population, the court is exploiting them economically and dominating them by force. That structure is inherent to the existing system. Revolutionary tendencies are tendencies to ease the violence, ease the exploitation, such that once power is attained by the peripheral ethnical population, we can then say, we, those of the peripheral ethnical population, can then say, we're in control and we're going to put a stop to all of this exploitation. What usually happens is not the ideal, where everybody sits around and roasts marshmallows and everything's fine. What usually happens, almost always happens, almost always happens, is those former victims now become the next generation's victimizers. And they use retribution as a means of politically dominating and economically exploiting their former exploiters, right? And the cycle goes back and forth and there's existing tension. This then manifests into what's known as generational grievances. Generational grievances have the tendency to then escalate to generational conflict and possibly genocide, as typified in, you know, Hutu-Tutsi uh, conflict, any number of conflicts, right? But that is probably most prototypical. Um, conflict. So, uh, I think this this makes sense, right? The distinction then, if it's really formalized um, in terms of a national separation, it could turn an intra-state into an inter-state, so that you can have the preservation of, at least in theory, right? You could have the preservation of state boundaries and a separation, and an internal separation that leads to the formation of new states. Uh, and, and this, I mean, that's the whole point of secessionism. If you think about this in the United States, typically, you'll hear every now and then um, some group, collective grouping, uh, saying that the way in which they're going to identify themselves is they're going to be the new 51st state. I just heard about this, uh, as a matter of fact, recently. I'm not going to give any credit to the group by talking about the name of the group, but... The idea is, yeah, we're going to be the 51st state, and here's our movement, and here's how we're going to go about doing that. Fine. The identity is, you can see it creates, it creates a, a fission in existing borders, borders be it, you know, not geographical borders, but conceptual borders, state borders, such that some state now, which is one state, will be separated, and what was one state, what was once, you know, Pennsylvania or Virginia or Maryland or what have you, will now become two states, right? V Virginia is going to become Virginia and West Virginia, and West Virginia might become West Virginia and Eastern Virginia or something. You can imagine, right? So that the, what was one mass, what was intra, becomes divided, and now it becomes inter. Right? So the transformation of intrastate to interstate as a consequence of successful secessionism, right? Uh, that should be should be clear. Okay, so moving on. Um, conceptualization of capital expansionism versus nationalism, right? So I want to talk about um, capital expansionism, which I've been discussing a bit, and nationalism. So, number one. The image does not represent increased geography, though it could. So I think I just explained that, right? What we've done is we've looked at the, the borders of an existing state. We've recognized that the existing state, I-N-T-R-A, intra-state, 
has ethnical existing intrastate ethnical conflict. And intrastate conflict is the big thing now in terms of conflict, right? Genocidal conflict almost always is itself the culmination of intrastate conflict, right? Gen genocide is typically, with a few exceptions, Nazi Germany being one of the greatest exceptions, but sort of historically speaking, genocidal regimes are usually concerned with intrastate ethnical com conflict, right? It's a consequence of intrastate conflict. Now, in terms of, it doesn't necessarily always need to be ethnical, it can be um, social as well. I mean, uh, Cambodia is, is probably more social than it is ethnical because they were all the same ethnicity for all purposes, all practical purposes. It was more in a sort of um, um, a social distinction in terms of any number of social characteristics, many they were. The idea is the borders don't change. The borders are the same. What ends up happening is the secessionist movement, for example, um, is or is not successful. If it is successful, then the same geographic area now has two states as opposed to one state. What was an intra-state conflict could then evolve into an inter-state conflict. So instead of having one nation having a civil war, we could now have two nations having international war. Uh, and, you know, it sounds like this is sort of too nuanced and maybe we're parsing things here a little too, this is a little bit too conceptually meaningless. But the truth of the matter is an international war is, is significantly different from a civil war, right? Civil conflict, civil war conflict, a lot of the internal tensions, this is why genocide is so hard to... It's so hard to intervene on behalf of those who are targeted for extermination, provided the genocidal campaign is intra-state, which it usually is, because the state has its own national sovereignty. So to intervene is very, very complicated for any number of um, existing international legal reasons, right? You have to know for certain, blah, 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 blah. If the conflict is international, what was one state now becomes two states. The two states are still feuding despite the fact that it used to be the same geographic area and both states are still sort of waging the old ethnical conflict, it's completely different to now have an international war, a war between two different states. Um, what will readily happen is you'll have states mobilized behind one team, states mobilized if it gets significant enough behind another team, and now you have escalating international conflict with any number of players backing either party. This quickly could devolve into something extremely destructive, thus it's been the tendency, and it probably will be, it will probably will continue to be the tendency that ethnical conflict will remain intrastate, right? National conflicts um, will be maintained within the sovereignty of the nation, but the ethnical beef, if you will, to sort of use a colloquial term, the ethnical beef between um, you know, any ethnical identities, any ethnical groups, probably segmentary, right? Probably wouldn't be binary because it's any number of ethnical tensions, right? So segmentary ethnical tension will likely remain intrastate because there's more control when it's intrastate, right? Acceptable levels of violence can be, uh, this is really dark stuff, but it's true. You can maintain acceptable levels of violence and still preserve the cohesion of state power and state identity. But if secessionists and such rise to power and thus challenge the power of the state and actually succeed in creating a new state, the boundaries don't necessarily need to expand. We're still talking about the same territorial boundaries. What happens is there's a division within the state, and now any existing beef in the future could really mobilize more international tension because now it's not intrastate, it's interstate, and people are going to pick teams, right? So, really sort of complicated bit, but I think, hopefully, I've explained um, that bit of complication so that it's clear. Uh, number two, ideological capitalism necessitates the formation of nations as a means of propagating capitalism, right? And I don't think that this is a bad thing at all. I think the formation, we, we know for a fact, that there's no question about it. The next hundred years, we'll probably see the creation of any number of states. I would say probably off the top of my head, the next century, at least 15, maybe 20. There has to be, right? There's always going to be the formation of new states. It's not an easy thing. It's usually blood-soaked. 
Um, but maybe we, again, as I said, maybe we, we can change such that the formation of new states can be um, a consequence of less and less violent and more and more nonviolent means more rational, more deliberative processes of recognition that it's not about violence and the exportation, it's about business and making money. And uh, everything that comes with making money. I lop a lot of things in this that probably people wouldn't. Morality and all that stuff I put in sort of this. I use, well, I erased it. <laughs> um, sort of capital is importing, uh, importing capital. I think a lot of good can come from that, but I know a lot of people don't believe that, so I won't get into that. I'm in the minority here. Um, the super minority. With respect then to this next era, right, with respect to how ethnical populations, oopsie, with respect to how ethnical populations um, interact in the future, it's it's important to recognize that, I mean, and I got to be careful with this because I know a lot of people are averse to the idea that capital does good. The, the overwhelmingly, <laughs> overwhelmingly, the narrative is capital is the worst force ever and freeing ourselves from this plague will, you know, it's the only way of bettering humanity, I categorically, unequivocally disagree with that position. You don't have to believe me, and I'm not biasing my lecture, but whether you believe that the effects are good or the effects are bad, the truth of the matter is that capital, ideological capitalism, necessitates the formations of nations as a means of propagating capital. I think that that's a good thing. You can definitely believe that that's a bad thing, but what's not to be debated is that this occurs. This occurs, right? I, ideological capitalism, as I said in the in the, the previous example, you see that we've gone from one dollar sign. I just use dollar signs because I'm in the states, but one dollar sign to another dollar sign, meaning that capital has it could be a euro, it could be a yen, it could be a pound, it could be whatever. But the idea is, capital has produced. Um, a means for diversifying more capital. Does it have to be exploitative? Does it have to be, have to be entrenched with violence? No, it doesn't. It really doesn't because the goal isn't about violence. Violence has only ever been a means except for really fiendish, perverse um, errors in our history. But violence has only ever been a means. If we can secure the end, which is capital, and transform the means such that it's non-violence, well, hey, no problem. You know, this is a global good. This is a good for the people. They recognize the power that they have. They recognize the manner in which they can mandate and necessitate social transformation and political transformation is by appealing to their money. The state also recognizes that in terms of its relationship, it can't continually export whatever the state might be, whoever the state might be, can't continually export exploitation. Why? Because if we continue to export exploitation, that's going to hurt our bottom line. If that's not a moral good, I don't know what is, right? That, I mean, that sounds like a moral good to me. It sounds like the world is a better place to me. Why? If we make the recognition that the appeal has to be to money. Now, the reason why this is problematic is religious, and I can't get into that, right? The, the appeal has historically on both, uh, no matter what your religious beliefs are, from the monotheistic traditions. I'm not so sure about Judaism. I really don't know much about Judaism, which is a shame. So I don't know what the relationship to money in Judaism is. I know um, in terms of the Islamic belief, and definitely in terms of the Christian belief, um, the idea is the... And I would imagine in Judaism as well, right? We don't look to money for our morality, right? We look to the transcendent, the divine. We look to some other world, you know, some other realm, some supernatural entity for our our morality. We look to codified rules that really come from that divine. I really don't know how, I, you know, it's funny, now that I think about it, I really don't know how, I don't know what Jewish morality is. I, I'm sure they have, of course they have morality, but I don't know, like, I know where um, Muslims get their morality. I know enough, very little bit, but I know enough of the Quran to understand how their morality is a consequence of the influence from Muhammad and how that came from Allah and such. I get that. In terms of Christianity, same thing, Jesus Jesus as a prophet, um, you know, brings the law to earth and it goes through Moses and it culminates in the death of Christ and all that other stuff. I get that. I don't know the Jewish tradition, um, but no one, to my knowledge, is talking about, no, let's look at money for morality, right? Why not look at 
the use of money and the function that it has, really the use function of money as the greatest moral good, um, because, I don't know, people just think it's obscene, and I just don't think it is. I think it's, I think it's, I think it is, it potentially is the greatest force for good, moral good, in that we can make ethical appeals to how we use our money. And I think, for me personally, it stops at money, which isn't to knock people's religious beliefs. I'm not trying to disparage people's religious beliefs at all. What I'm saying is, we can have an alternative morality that can be grounded in the very thing that people thought was the greatest force for evil, right? It's, which is why it might seem so bad for me to say it, but if you think about it logically and you put your emotions aside, why wouldn't that be a good, right? Why wouldn't it be better than saying, I'm going to take up a gun and go, you know, kill those in political power so that I can claim ownership of political power to, to forego that exploitation, by, isn't it obviously better to say, well, no, I have money, and I'm going to use my money, and look what happened in the civil rights protests, right? It was the economic power of capital that really resulted in the recognition. Why not look at slavery? It was the cotton gin that, that ended slavery. Let's keep it real. You know, it was the fact that slavery ended up not being cost-effective. Why slavery ended? Why not look at the potential power of cash? of money, as, and we all know it's fake, it's socially constructed, we all know that, but what else are we going to use, right? Until, you know, I've been waiting for years now to hear of an alternative system, even if you talk about cryptocurrency, it's still money, no matter what, you're, we haven't gotten past that, so in terms of that system, since that system is already a value system, money is about value, it's about scarcity, it's about value, it's about the attribution of value to this concept of currency. But the concept, currency, is only an incarnation of value. It's a value system. Money is a value system. Thus, since we're already having a system in place that attributes value to stuff via commodification, why can't we use that existing value system to talk about the creation of our moral ethic, what we ought to do? It, it, for everyone, I think it seems so perverse an idea. For me, it seems so natural an idea. We already have an enormous functioning system of values. Why not operationalize that system of values so that we can talk about a very concrete, very realizable, very logical, very tangible um, ethics that is not based in anything other than money, right? Um, it's an idea. It's probably a way out there idea, but it's an idea, right? There are alternatives, right? And there, we should be tolerant of alternatives. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, fine. But the idea is, it's better using my money, putting my, uh, my vote in terms of how I spend my dollar, I think is better than picking up a gun and killing someone. Right? I think it's, it's, it's more powerful, it's more impactful. I think it's actually better. Right? I, think it's, I think it's a moral thumbs up. Right? Um, so, that's that. Number three, nations and nationalisms, a nation and nationalism are the products of specifically modern processes like capitalism. That's a direct quote, right? Nations and nationalism are the products of specifically modern processes like capitalism. And I've already explained the propagation, right? right? So the idea is what I always try to do in my lectures is to give you an understanding of the theory to justify that understanding in the text, which is what number three does, and then to show you how we can make this happen in the real world. Like, this isn't me just sitting around thinking about quirky ideas, right? The point now, I think, is why aren't we creating an ethical value in capital? Why aren't we doing this? If I want, you know, I could defend this, logically. I could defend this against any host of attacks. The idea is why aren't we doing this other than sort of, I don't know, an almost illogical, irrational fear of, money is always having to be bad, right? Because we've been told that. What, 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 is, what are we seeing? Don't we see some good coming from this? Don't we see how people are transforming their livelihood, how they're transforming their quality of life, how they're demanding political recognition, how they're demanding political inclusion by appealing to their collective use of money? Doesn't that mean that they can have power, that they can share power, 
because they've made appeals to money, doesn't that mean that the state then would be less likely to be violent towards others because they recognize that the exportation of their violence and abuse on those might collectively incentivize people to stop spending their money? Doesn't that mean that we're not going to dominate as much? We're not going to exploit as much because we don't want to mess up our money? Isn't that a better world that we live in and the appeal that we make as those individuals of the world and those in power? Aren't both of our appeals exactly the, exactly the same thing? Money? I mean, it seems legit to me. Seems legit to me. I, I mean, in terms of an ethic, it's already a value system. Why not make it an ethical system, right? And, you know, I'm open to suggestions, so tell me why it's a horrible idea. Tell me, Jason, no, you don't understand. That's the worst thing you can possibly do because X, Y, Z. Enlighten me. I'm open to I'm open to reason, right? That's what I'm open to. So I could be wrong. Um, and if I'm wrong, you have to, it's your responsibility to explain why I'm wrong, right? What is it about that that I'm so off track. Why would capital as a value system, not in terms of codification, but in terms of morality, why would capital as a value system be the worst thing ever? Um, it'd be interesting to hear a rebuttal. Um, okay, oh my goodness, this thing is super long. I still got another full page. This is madness. <laughs> okay, uh, number four. Um, as capitalism spreads and smashed the ancient social formation surrounding it, I need to quote, as capitalism spread and smashed the ancient social formation surrounding it, this is ethnical identification, these always tended to fall apart, right? these ancient social formations, the formations devolved, they fell apart, along the fault lines contained inside them. It is a matter of elementary truth, and that allegorical bit of fault lines, I don't like that type of language, but I mean, it's fine. Um, it's a bit vague. It is a matter of elementary truth that these lines of fission were nearly always one of nationality. So the idea is the author has already said it, right? As, um, as capitalism spreads, capitalism tends to be a consequence of nation, national identity, na national formation. Thus, it seems to be the case that if we can infer this, you can absolutely infer this, that since that's been the case historically, and you can point to any number of instances where that has been the case, new emerging nation, new emerging nations in the next century or so, I mean, nations don't pop up overnight, um, new emerging nations, whether they assume the path of violence or they assume the path of nonviolence, the point is, either through violence or nonviolence, it is likely that the newly formed nation will be yet another vehicle for propagating capital, right? the nation will find itself always already, just like language, just like language, just like religious beliefs. We talked about this, right? And uh, the correlation between geographic location of birth and the likelihood to be affiliated with this religion and the obvious recognition that geographic location of birth influences language. There's no question about that. Though we can learn any language, it's where you're born and the community that surrounds you that heavily impacts language acquisition, barring a few exceptions. It's likely the case then that since the global social, the global economic order is capital, the emergence of any nation anywhere on the globe is going to assume that global order. That global order already exists. It exists right now. It's always already functional. Go to ATMs, go to the freaking you know, debit machines and get your money. We do business internationally. Money is the norm. Anything that emerges in that environment is likely to emerge within the context of the environment, thus any new nations to emerge are likely to propagate capital. Could it be the case that a nation emerges that does not do that? Yes. Would that emergence cause problems? Absolutely. That would be hugely problematic, right? The emergence, I mean, conceptually, it's, it's absolutely plausible, but it would be really bizarre. Right. Think about, think about um, going against the grain and then magnify it by a billion. And of course, you know I hate sort of allegorical speech, but you got to think about how abrasive it would be for new national identity, a new emerging nation, to finally attain, to even think that it would attain sovereignty and exist. I don't even know if it's possible to think of, this is a good question, you know, for me, I would have to think about, is it even possible to talk about, in terms of nationhood, 
the emergence of a 21st, hypothetically, right? Hypothetically, is it possible to talk about, of course it's possible, right? How would we conceptualize the emergence of a 21st nation, 21st century nation, um, that existed independent to capital? I can't even think of how that would occur. I can't even think of how that would occur. That would be a good project for you. Conceptualize how that might occur. What would be the conditions needed to um, account for the possibility of a new national identity, new nation formation, within the context of global capital, wherein the nation itself was socialist or non-capital. Yeah, I, I, you know, it would be hard to do business. It would, it would hard. It would be hard to even get to that point. Um, so, I, I mean, it's that perfect, per pervasive, right? The power of um, ideological capital is that pervasive that. It's a given that 21st century nations, if there are any, and there probably will be some, um, maybe 15 is a bit high though, um, 21st century nations will, new nations will assume that always already given, that is, they will absorb themselves into the fold of capital as doing business as normal. Um, you can imagine the niche though, right? That niche is huge, right? We're talking about macro level niche, right? New markets and such. The idea that a nation could emerge that did not conform to that fact is actually pretty interesting, right? I don't know what that would be, though. So bottom of page 27, uh, and I'm going to read this bit, and then I'm going to pause. Non-dominant ethnic groups lacking their own state, occupying a compact territory, dominated by an um, exogenous, an exogenous ruling class, that is, a ruling class belonging to a different ethnic group, we talked about that, sooner or later these non-dominant, this is the peripheral, sooner or later these non-dominant ethnic groups become or became aware of their own ethnicity and started to conceive of themselves as a potential nation. Actually, I can, I can continue, right? They started to conceive of themselves as a potential nation and thus the inclination to usurp existing political power and the formation of um, a new system of power. It could be um, intrastate, and thus they were they the old guard was kicked out, and we are occupying um, positions of political power. But the state has remained the same. Or it could be as extensive as the success in a secessionist movement, where there are two states in the same uh, territorial sort of uh, location. So, nationalism and political transformation is next. Articulates the notion of nationalism as a form of politics, right? Um, yeah, I can see that. I don't want to get into the, sort of the conceptualization of nationalism as politics too much because there's any number of ways in which we can interpret politics. Politics is a function. Politics is the business of nationhood, if you will. And there are any number of ways to incorporate that. But there is some truth that um, articulates the notion of nationalism as a form of politics. Um, I don't want to get too much into that because it's a bit vague. No. Number two, nationalism is above all about politics. I like that better. Nationalism is above all about politics, and politics is about power. I mean, that's just like a super good line. Next, number two, I'm going to highlight that myself. So... Nationalism is about, uh, nationalism above all is about politics, and politics is about power. Um, sometimes social theorists are good, but their logic is a bit off. Um, you can't, the biconditional isn't necessarily interchangeable. You can't just say that if P then Q, um, therefore if Q then P. It doesn't work like that, and some of this sounds like that. You can't just say, I think the right interpretation is the second. Nationalism is about politics, right? nationalism is about politics, but to say then politics is about nationalism, it doesn't follow at all. But nationalism is about politics. The idea of nationhood is about operationalizing those functions of the nation through politics, through legislation, through policy, in order to preserve the interests of the nation. So that we have the nation as an abstraction and all of the interactive um, departments and functions of the state, and many, 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 many. Anybody who's been to any government, you know, building or any government 
um, organization recognizes that it's built on hierarchy and there's a million different groups and there's a million different departments of. The idea of the, all of these groups and all of these departments of this and the department of that and the department of this and the, you know, the reason that's in place is that the nation operationalizes its interests through politics. Politics is a function of the nation. It's important to recognize that, right? The, the nation uses, in a sense, politics, national, nationhood, uses politics as the means of arriving at its interests, which is why I, you, I can't see how you could say politics informs the nation. I think that's wrong. I think that's perversely wrong. So, my battery died uh, unexpectedly, so I just want to go over this bit again. Um, so, nationalism is above all politics, and politics is about power. What I was doing, so I just want to sort of, um, sort of rehash what I was saying before, because part of it might have been lost. Um, number one, nationalism as a form of politics, right? Okay, nationalism as a form of politics, what I was saying is, in terms of the biconditional, you can't say, it's not logically correct to say, sort of, if A, then B, and then say, therefore, if B, then A. You can have a biconditional relationship where you say, if A, then B, and if B, then A. You can sort of say that, right? There, there is a way that you can say that, but there's no sense, there's no sense in which, just because I say A informs B, that I can draw the conclusion that B informs A. That's false. And the problem, logically, with what the author has said here is that, though I'm sure it wasn't his interest to say that, he's making a pretty egregious equivocation. At least it seems as though we're saying politics informs national identity and national identity informs politics, and that's false. It's absolutely false. Politics does not inform national identity. It does not. It's a consequence of the nation. The nation is itself the condition in which politics is operationalized, so that politics is operationalized through the nation. Right. So, in terms of how this looks, um, we can talk about the nation, and the nation informs our politics. Right. Our politics are a consequence of our nation, the existing nation. Thus, the, the nation is itself sufficient. It, the nation becomes a sufficient condition for politics. Which makes sense, right? You can't talk about, you can't talk about politics without talking about the politics of. We're talking about the politics of a nation. To talk about the politics of, independent to the existence of a nation, you're not really talking about politics, right? You're talking about something else. You're using the word wrong. That's not what the word means. The nation is, in and of itself, the sufficient condition for that which is necessitated as a consequence. That which is necessitated as a consequence of the nation is its politics. And what politics does is it operationalizes, it puts into practice the structure of nationhood. Like you can think of nation building. The nation builds itself up, it builds itself out. What I was saying when this, when the, when the video sort of died out, what I was saying is in relationship to the nation, um, it's, it's all the departments of, right? It's the department of this, it's the department of that, it's the department of this. You, we have all the department of statistics and labor, the department of this, the, the environmental protection agency, the agency of that, the this, the that. The nation has all of these multifaceted departments and agencies of X, Y, Z. And the question is, why are why is that in place and why is that the norm, right? They, nations call it different, but all nations have these, right? There's a bureaucracy, and that bureaucracy has... Um, appropriate and corresponding infrastructural representation. Why does that? Why is that the case? It's the case because it's through these agencies, it's through these departments, it's through their function that the work of politics is entrenched. Right? It's in the departments and the agencies and the interaction between therein that politics manifests. Right culminating in many instances in really policy and legislation, right? Conditions in which social interaction, business interaction um, are regulated, right? It's a place in which the regulatory mechanisms are implemented. It's a consequence of the nation. It's not the other way around, right? To say that the nation's a consequence of politics is perversely wrong. It's completely inaccurate. 
So, not to say that the author was saying that, I'm not saying that the author was saying that, but it could be interpreted as his logic was a little, his language is a little sort of, uh, a little unclear, and for me, I want to make it clear in terms of the lecture that you cannot have this other way around, right? You can have politics informing or transforming national identity, but in order not to equivocate, we would have to define how we're using politics, and I would imagine that if you were to reductively look at the logic, we're equivocating in the use of politics, right? Um, we're using politics to mean one thing in one interpretation and politics to mean something else in another interpretation. But in the strictest sense, politics is the operationalization, it's the regulatory operationalization of nationhood. It's how nations do business, right? Nations do business with the execution and operationalization of politics. So that the idea is that the nation is the government, right? Right? The nation is the government, and government informs governance. Right. So we're looking at the distinctions between government as nation and politics as governance. Politics is governance, regulatory, um, judiciary. It's all of that. Right. It's the whole bit. It's all of governance. Politics is governance. The nation is government. And the nation is, it's a little bit of both, and what we'll see, and you could formalize this, which I won't, which I actually could formalize this. There's a way in which we could formalize it, I'm not going to get into it now, where you can say that it's a bit of both. You would have to formalize the argument, we need more um, variables and other connectors, blah, 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 but I'm not going to get into that now. But for now, at this sort of, this is really not surface level, but in terms of logic, this is surface. In terms of concept formation, it's pretty deep, but in terms of logic, this is sort of superficial. The idea is that our government informs our governance. Simple. The, our governance informs our government could be true, but it isn't necessarily true. We would need other conditions in order to complete the biconditional, right? In order to say that our governance informs our government, you can't just make that inference based on if government, then governance, therefore if governance, then government. You can't do that logically. There are ways in which, and some of you know logic well enough, in order to, already immediately, it's not really that hard to figure out conditions that I can make that link, but you need other things. You need more information. There needs to be more here in order to complete a biconditional relationship. You can't just assume that. That's, that's a, a logical no-no. Okay. So, that, that, sort of clarifies whatever was lost in uh, the video going out. So the relationship between nationalism and modernization is one of transformation, where the division of labor supports diversified sociological functions. And that's just, I mean, I wrote that myself, and that's just genius. I thought it was a quote, but it is pretty damn good, um, if I say so myself. So the relationship between nationalism and modernization is one of transformation. I talked about sort of the, the new contemporary model of political transformation via nonviolence. I mean, um, Mandela just died. Look what he was able to accomplish. Look what Gandhi was able to accomplish. Look what MLK was um, able to accomplish, and many, many more and such, right? D to think that that movement, the nonviolent movement, and now that I'm thinking about it, wow, there's a lot that I could probably look at from a conceptual level. It'd be interesting. Um, it's not really in my nature, per se, to... I'm not naturally inclined to, to looking at sort of nonviolent movements, not that I'm all about violence, it's just not something that I've ever been interested in, but now, within this context, I can see why I might be interested, right? It's a very, it could potentially be a very powerful moral tool um, for enacting social transformation, viable social transformation, if given any number of other caveats. Why? Because it's about governance, right? It's about the consequence. Right? It's about the necessary state of the consonants. We are being governed through governance, and this is how governance is impacting us, for good, for bad, and blah, blah. This is how regulation and law is impacting us. We hear this from the business community all the time. I don't know why we don't hear this from the social community. Business folks are in tuned to governance. You better believe it. Oh, you want to add new regulations? That's going to make my ability to sell product X here that much harder. Are you going to, you know, add additional taxes on my XYZ? No, your form of governance is affecting my bottom line, and you hear the business community lobbying hard. What do they lobby for? Politics. They play the game of politics. They play the game of governance. 
because the business community recognizes the power of governance. I don't know why people haven't made that recognition. I don't know why social movements haven't made exactly the same recognition. It doesn't have to be, we cannot, the people cannot compete with business money. We can't. Their pockets are too damn deep. But we have something that they don't have, which is number. And the idea is, it's about that. It's about consolidated, coordinated effort, which is really, really hard in a distracted, ADD-ridden, completely sort of lost tech world that we live in. I mean, the time span of some people now is, I mean, 10 minutes is tough, right? Which is precisely why I do these videos, because it took me weeks to compile, and it's taken me hours to present, but... You know, I'm part of that old model. It's a real old model now where, you know, you can't really get what you need until you have to do it through an exertion of effort, an exertion of patience. It can't just be right now. The business community is as powerful a lobbying force as it is, and I mean the business community collectively because they recognize that the changes that they need aren't going to be had right now. That I'm going to put in position... Um, movements I'm going to put into position, I want to see legislation, I want to see bills that are going to help me, not today, but in my future, and in maybe, you know, 20, 30 years. I don't know how far ahead they're planning, but some, I would imagine some businesses are 20, 25, maybe even 50 years ahead. People are so distracted, they're so, you know, they're so distracted that they don't recognize that people have exactly the same power as well. We, as people, can put into practice our collective coordinated efforts to inform and influence governance, how we are governed, such that governance facilitates our interests. The question is, we got to mobilize, one. Two, we have to be able to express our demands and our interests. Two, and insofar as we've expressed, mobilized our demands, uh, we've um, mobilized ourselves and expressed our demands, we need to get political. We need to send people, representatives, on behalf of our collective grouping so that the political establishment knows that we're serious, that we're not playing. Um, but if we can't do that, and I really feel like we just can't do that, I mean, if Occupy is our best effort, then we're doomed. <laughs> then we're doomed. I mean, shout out to the idea that's Occupy, but the truth of the matter is, is if you're not complaining about governance, and business is complaining about governance, then the political establishment will readily address the needs of and the demands of the business community because their demands are being made clear daily, and the people are okay. Now, if the business demands go in opposition to public interests, it's not that the political establishment is... It's just simply because the business community is backing lobbyists and there's money and such is that there's a constant streams of demands that are being stated by the business community. And if the, the I, think of, I think of the government as sort of personified, right? Um, so part Uncle Sam, part Lady, Lady Liberty will do that other in terms of gender. And, the, it, you know, the nation has its ear to both. Hey, do I hear anything from society? No, nah, they seem to be cool. They just want the new iPod. Okay, well, we're not in the business of making iPods, so, okay, no problem. And I put my ear to the business community. <laughs> okay, what do you want? Okay, we'll see what we can do. Okay, let's check with, back with the people. Do the people want anything? Nah, they're just playing, you know, 16 hours of World of Warcraft. They're, they'll be okay. Well, business community demands. You can imagine. Well, I'm going to address the needs of those people who are making their needs known. And when I check to see if the people need anything, if you don't need anything, okay, fine. If... The policies that are being executed as a consequence of the demands, then, of the business community are in opposition to the people. You need to let me know that. You need to let me know that. Now, it's not fair just for the people to say, oh, you need to be able to project that the interests of the business community are necessarily going to be um, antithetical to our interests socially. Um, no, I mean, let us know what it is you need, then we have something to work with, right? So, and I say us as though I were part of the political establishment, I'm clearly not. But it's important, the, the impetus here is that it's important that we, the people, make our interests known um, and that we mobilize 
especially with social media, you would think this would be easier, right? And that we motion, we mobilize um, to to gain the, the the threshold, right? Uh, sort of, yeah, we're not just like any rinky-dink movement, right? This isn't just some, you know, some, you know, interest that we have to just sit together and socialize. This isn't a social group. What we're doing is we're a social group. If social group means social transformation, and we're going to get our interests um, met and heard. Okay. So three eight. So we must anticipate then that um, sociological functions, what individual people do and what communities do, what businesses do, we must anticipate then that sociological functions warranting transformation within the division in labor will increase with technological advancement, etc. I'll explain that. While antiquated sociological functions will decrease as a consequence of technological obsolescence, switchboards, operators, and such. So that we have to anticipate that sociological functions warranting transformation within the divisions of labor will increase with technological advancement. What does that mean? Okay. Sociological divisions of labor. The divisions of labor, sort of job functions. What people do. What people do in terms of the labor market is directly, um, is directly connected to technological advancement. Obviously, duh. There would be no cubicle farms as much as people hate those, there would be no cubicle farms were it not for the advent of the PC. The advent of the PC created the condition for this new labor market. So technological advancement created the sufficient condition for the advent of cubicle farms, right? You can see how technology created an enormous, I mean, this is why jobs is a really, really big deal. And this is why Gates and others are really, really big deals because it's not just the function of the PC. And I'm giving you business folks a gem here. You know, so if you're in it for the money, don't say Dr. Campbell never gave you a gem. It isn't so much about making money on a niche or making money on a functionality or making money on some utility. It's trying, and it's a difficult thing to do, to project ahead to conceptualize what the labor market might look like and create a product that facilitates an emerging market, an emerging labor market. The PC wasn't necessarily intended at its, at its sort of outset to transform, transform the labor market. It was for personal use. What the PC did was transformed the labor market. The labor market is now almost exclusively defined by personal computers, right? By laptops and such and mobile technologies and that, 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 that. So that the idea is, um, it's important, as is the case, to recognize that technological advancement is completely in, um, abound. It's inextricable with the concept of emerging labor, labor markets, right? As technology changes, our labor markets will change. As those labor markets change, social functions change, right? We no longer have people... Um, writing on typewriters, I don't know what the name would have been, like if uh, secretaries that type, I don't know, like, you watch those old war films, and they have like, it's pr primarily women, like a whole bunch of women working at the Air Force typing letters, right, in mass, everybody typing exactly the same letter. That function, um, that function within the labor market is completely defunct. Now, one person types a letter, and it's carbon copied and sent out via email to everybody and there's no need to hire 45 people to write the same letter over 200 times, right? We just, um, we just duplicate it digitally. Think about the amount of money, capital, that was saved in making that switch. And it's not just, oh, look at all those jobs that were lost, no. That technology also created new needs in the market, which basically just relocated employers, uh, employees. Employees went from one defunct social function within the labor market to a new emerging social function. So it's not, oh, oh, look at all the jobs that will be lost. No, it's, I mean, that's really sort of narrow-minded. The idea is, yes, jobs were lost, jobs will be lost, but new jobs will be created as a consequence of new technological advancement, right? And we have to try and anticipate what technological advancements will influence labor market conditions and also what technological advancements might create new opportunities for employees, right? New opportunities for labor.
B, um, that all then necessitates, this is actually, you know, not to toot my own horn, but this is pretty damn good. Um, I might end up writing a little bit on this because I am sort of interested in it. Um, which then necessitates that political power facilitates emerging divisions in labor market by educational reform. The example is science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM. I don't know if it's everywhere nationally, it's here in, the, in Florida. And STEM training is, uh, STEM education is obviously governmental policy. It's policy now that schools incorporate science, technology, engineering, and math. There is a sense in which the labor market is going to benefit from children's education in science, technology, engineering, and math. My kids, I'm trying to, like, a good parent, you know, persuade them to entertain code, persuade them to entertain computer science. If they go off to become philosophers, fine, but, and I, I'm not the type of parent, I'm not into that tiger crap, right? It's, it's more, you do what you want to do, you'll be okay. Dad's going to take care of you regardless. You can go out and explore the world and define your own identity, but while you're young, I want to expose you to these things, right? Check out these computer things, see what, see what they do. Tell me about this code. Show me how that code works. Explain it to me because I don't know. The idea is um, there is a recognition that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics will facilitate advances in patents and intellectual pro property rights and such for the nation. But it's also going to be, obviously, duh, a good collaborative um, vehicle. STEM is specifically now. STEM would be a good collaborative vehicle for the business market and the emerging the emerging labor pool. Right? The business market will benefit. Why? Because the business market is going more and more technological, which means the labor pool needs to be more technologically trained. The more technologically trained the labor market is, the more advances in the business community there are. The less technically trained the labor market is, surprisingly, however, what will end up happening is those who attain Proficiency are going to go from zero to 60 in one second. And that's the case now. So huge demand, so few individuals, such that those individuals that can meet those demands, these people, you know, you make six figures overnight. Um, that's going to change. The trend will be less and less and less, so now's the time. right? Before the labor market becomes saturated with individuals who have proficiency and thus that inverse relationship of su supply being really, really, um, really, really high. Um, it's important to it's important to recognize, right? It's important to recognize that now is the time to diversify your sort of portfolio of experience, which you have, uh, and and that I think it's I, I think it's a good thing, right? I think I think it's a good thing that the government is. And I think they should be doing more. I think, to be honest with you, they could be doing tremendously more. Me personally, as a quick side note before I wrap up this section, um, I think the government should be endorsing community college education more. I think they should be endorsing technical education more, two-year degrees more. It's not about going to school and getting a PhD, right? Uh, it's not that I'm trying to protect anything because I'm not really challenged by anybody. And my position is secure. The idea is... We're not talking about me, we're talking about the nation, we're talking about collective people. You don't have to go get a four-year degree in order to have a good standard of living. You could, you know, go take, fly to Cali, take a crash course, I think they have like a six-month, eight-month crash course on coding. Take some little course, get a little certificate, and you could be making ten times the money I'm making, right? You could, you could contribute back more than I'm contributing based on you know, two years worth of education rather than what I did, which was, I don't even know, I lost count, 12, 16 years worth of education. So the, things are changing. And since things are changing, we need sort of the thumbs up. We need an approval. We need a, a go-ahead from our from our leaders to say, no, don't think that this is bad, right? Community colleges are good. Go get a degree, two-year degree. Go learn coding. You don't necessarily have to. Not to dissuade people, but to let people know this is a legitimate, viable option. Uh, and I think it is, right? So lastly... <clears throat> and then we'll be done. The section ended up being a lot longer than I thought. Um, three basic assumptions for national nationalist arguments. So, one, there exists a nation with an explicit and peculiar, peculiar character. Sort of obvious. Two, the interests and values of the nation, of this nation, take priority all 
over all interests and values, right? So that the interest of the nation becomes the greatest interest. The means in which those interests are attained is through politics, through governance, right? Uh, I forgot to put that, right? So that this leads into national interest. Right? So government is in place to, to secure a national interest, and the way that government secures national interest is via politics or governance. Right? It's through the functionality of government that governance yields national interest, right? If it's doing its job right. Uh, clearly, there are cases where decisions undermine national interests. For example, um, Iraq War and those decisions that legitimize and justify the governance that legitimize and justify the Iraq War actually was counterproductive to our interests. But, you know, it's the point of the matter is at the time, and I'm not going to go into this, but at the time, given the amount of information, I actually do believe it wasn't ominous, it wasn't sort of uh, strong-arming a position, as it was, and I've researched on this, so I'm not just saying this from conjecture, it was, based on the information at the time, it was the best possible decision. Um, I might be too charitable, sure, you know, I'm open for that argument, but again, um, I've written on this, it's at the publisher, we'll see what happens in terms of the press, and i got to remember that, I'm going to give them a couple more weeks, by January I'll be submitting to somebody else. Um, We'll see how that plans out, but you know, sort of, I don't want to get too tangential. But the idea is government is in place to see its national interest realized. That's it. Its national interest is about the preservation and expansion of political power, as most ethically, hopefully, as, it, as can be done. And it's really no more complicated than that, um, at a very superficial level, of course. And then lastly, number three, the nation must be, an in, the na the nation must be as independent as possible. This usually requires at least the attainment of political sovereignty. And I mean, that just makes sense, right? The, you can't really talk about national identity. You can't talk about what the nation is if the nation cannot exist by itself. If the nation cannot um, espouse its independence from, part of being sovereign is about being independent. Now, there, that would require a substantial explanation because we live in a global order capitalism necessitates an other, right, there has to be an other for which we're doing business, right, so clearly this independence is in a lowercase i, but I'm not going to take the time, I think everybody understands sort of what sovereignty means, independence from external influence, the independence and the independent ability to um, determine the nature of governance and government from external outside influences, this is the sort of UN debate that you hear, there are some legitimacies to that. Um, George Bush, George W. Bush famously talked about, not, I think he did, I, I remember seeing it somewhere, where he's not going to cede the power of the United States to the United Nations and such. That kind of independence in, in terms of that. Um, so I think that should make everything clear. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my, uh, my lecture. Uh, we only have two more. We only have two more sections and then we'll be done. And I'll be moving on to the next adventure. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.